Before I get started with the video today, darlings, I wanted to let you know that it is sponsored by Skillshare. I am so happy to have Skillshare as a sponsor, not only because I can offer you an amazing free trial of the platform, but also because I get to be a member of Skillshare and enjoy their wonderful classes. And I'll be talking to you about one of those classes later in the video. Hello Pop-Tarts, welcome to the witchy area in my bedroom, in my flat. I would like to talk today about how to be a self-loving witchcraft practitioner. I would like to think that I have enough practice now to be able to give some strong tips and encouragement. I definitely have taken some wrong roads in this regard that I'm going to talk about today. So settle in, grab a beverage. I've got one but it's piping hot right now so I'm not going to touch it just yet. Um, and I'm going to talk you through a few different things that I have done that I don't think were very self-loving in my witchy path and things I try to be more cognizant of now and I try to put into play a bit more now because I recognise that they are the more self-loving way and I do think that you can witch in a more self-loving way or certainly in a less self-loving way where you're pitted against yourself, you are giving yourself lots of shitty self-talk, you know, you are not happy with your progress most of the time or not happy with the type of practitioner you are, or you can walk this more self-loving path where you recognise what is actually good for you and what is good for your practice and what makes you feel better about it and what makes it into a more productive part of your life, you know. So first thing I want to touch on is money, spending money. Um, I'm not going to go into it big time because I know that it's something that we talk about in the witchy community on and off you know through the time that I've been online talking about witchcraft definitely materialism has come up and I have made a couple of dedicated videos just about witchy materialism which I will leave in the down bar below if you have not seen them and you would like to I share a few of my ideas there they've probably moved on a bit since now since then sorry <laughs> I've been uh, doing this online witchy YouTube thing for the longest time now, so probably my thoughts have moved on, but I think most of those two videos are still quite solid, you know, where I talk about witchy consumerism, being sort of drawn into buying things for your practice that you don't need, that you convince yourself are the last word in witchcraft, or that you really need to get you onto the right um, the path that you want to be on or to uh, heighten your power as a practitioner and actually it's just another thing and then there's another thing that you want and you kind of get pulled into that um, consumerist circle cycle and, and it's important to break it. One self-loving way that I've found to make sure that money doesn't play too much of a massive role in my craft and to make sure I'm buying things that I appreciate and that I really will use and that I'm happy with is I have a list in my Filofax. I know that many of you know I'm I'm a real Filofax uh, lover and I've got a list in my A5 Domino. If you want to see my Filofax tour I'll leave that down below. I've got a list in there of things that I think might be good for for my craft or that I want, that I've seen, that other witches have or that I visualise myself using and I just make sure that I don't impulse buy those things by leaving them on the list and going back to the list sporadically and seeing do I still want that thing? Is it still something that is calling to me? And it's going to be no surprise to any of you as it wasn't really a surprise to me that some of the things or most of the things on that list I put on there and then when I revisit them and I visualise using them in my craft and I think about whether or not I still really, really want them, the desire has waned, okay? Like, <laughs> basically, you just want things in the moment and you visualise really strongly having that thing, especially if you're seeing another witch using it or you're seeing really beautiful aesthetic photos where that thing is featured or a witch is telling you that it's really helped their practice. And so obviously the visualisation comes in very strong, very hard, and you think, oh my God, I really want that. Basically, it was just training myself out of adding the thing to car or going out and buying it and just putting it on the list and revisiting that list. The list also doubles up as a really good list of treats for myself. So if I want to reward myself or I've got some excess income and I would like to spend it on myself because, you know, I like to buy myself presents. I love to buy my friends presents as well, but I like presents. I'm a friend to myself. OK, sometimes I want to buy myself a gift. The list really doubles up as a useful thing to visit so that if I am in the market for a present and I want to get myself something, I do get myself something that I've been thinking about for a long time. And I know that my heart has been in that for a few months because it's been on the list for a few months and I still 
want it. I'm still really excited to use it, whether it's a book I'm going to read, a deck I'm going to uh, get for myself, you know, um, the my crystal ball. I, I use my crystal ball so much. I love it. My crystal ball was on my witchy list for a long time. I did not go straight out and purchase a crystal ball. I wrote crystal ball down on my list of things that I might want for my witchy practice. And I revisited the list. And a few times I thought to myself, you know what? I really can see myself getting it. I thought about it for a while. It wasn't just this spontaneous thing. Came into my head one day and I straight away went out and invested because I don't want to do that. I want to make sure that I'm not overbuying. I'm not impulse buying. I'm not buying because I'm being convinced somehow that I need this thing for my path. And I definitely don't want to associate my witchcraft overtly with materialism, consumerism, needing to get the next thing and the next thing. Um, and so as a result of that, I think I've come to a much more self-loving sort of um, part of my path now where when I get something for myself, like I know if uh, I know a lot of you who who follow me on Instagram or who watched my um my vlog where I went out for the day and I met up with Cam you will have seen that I got myself a beautiful set of new set of runes um when I get myself something like that for my path I really relish it and I value it and that is something that for me uh, really ups the degree of self-love that I bring into my practice I I hate the feeling of being wasteful being grabby having that that need, that hole that needs to be filled inside me by stuff. I don't like that feeling. It's not good for me as a person. So it's not good for me as a witch. One thing that I do in my wider life, actually, that has I've sort of brought into my witchcraft is I think about what I've already got that I've forgotten about because that is the case for me with clothing and it's the case for me with books. So in my logic, I kind of thought to myself, well, it's probably the same for me in witchcraft as well. Like if I really want a particular deck that sort of works with a certain theme and makes me feel a certain thing, I will definitely go to my deck collection first and see what have I got that I've forgotten all about, that I haven't been appreciating, that I could do with at least taking out and just having a flick through and seeing actually could I could I bring this deck to my heart again? Have I ever bought this deck to my heart properly? Am I trying to go for something that works with a theme that I actually already have a deck for, you know? Um, when I think about things that I might want, like objects like talismans, for example, or things that represent something like jewellery, or, um, you know, I know it was the case for a long time with me with crystals when I was trying to stop, like, completely buying crystals. I'd think to myself, wait a minute, do you need that? What have you already got? What could you repurpose for this ritual or for this need that you have? And as it turns out, I've got something already that will do the job just fine. So, you know, that's also a very self-loving change that I made for myself. A very quick point that I want to make too on the subject of money and the craft is that I find that it's more self-loving to at least consider if I want to purchase an experience that will enhance me and my witchhood as opposed to an object for my witchhood, you know? So for example, nowadays I'm likely to purchase a course or think about purchasing a course or an experience like a sound healing or a Reiki session or a reading, something like that. I really like purchasing experiences or sort of going to pagan and witchy sites of interest or going to, you know, like witch, witch adjacent or witch related exhibitions stuff like that where I feel like um, I'm actually giving myself an experience, I'm putting myself more into the world or into my body and I'm giving myself that enhancement to my witchhood. It doesn't always have to be an object per se. And that's something that, again, I started practicing in my wider life when I thought about what I was doing with, with excess income. You know, what, what am I buying to enjoy and enhance life? In my wider life, I started thinking, how many experiences do I purchase versus objects? How many things versus stuff that I do? You know, um, and I brought that into my witchhood. So that's also kind of a useful thing as well, just a, a little aside there. Some of the things that I purchased for myself earlier on in my witchy path, especially books, especially learning resources like books, were things that I purchased because I saw that another witch was doing it, learning it, into it, and maybe it was a bit of a trend, maybe there was some hype around it for one reason or another, like a big, um, you, you know, sort of witchcraft book had come out about that thing or whatever, or it had been featured in a movie or something. And I do that, I was going to say I do that a lot less now. I don't do that at all now. I am really good at leaning in and checking in when it comes to what are my areas of interest? What are my strengths that I want to enhance? What are my sort of special focus areas as a witch? And if I want to add something new to my repertoire or I want to go in a new direction, I want to learn about something new, 
again, it's about taking my foot off that gas and thinking about it for a while before I just wade in and like purchase a book or purchase a course or whatever. Um, and of course, there's so many interesting free resources on the majority of things that I might want to sort of, you know, slightly get my feet wet with, but I don't know if I really want to fully dive in. Um, there's no excuse in my in my view not to take advantage of free resources first and sort of just feel into it. And especially if there's a lot of hype around a specific thing, or if I've happened to watch a video or read a blog post where that specific interest or that specific activity, that divination method, whatever it is, has been really celebrated and focused on. And suddenly I have this moment where I'm like, oh, I could get into that, you know? And so what I really wanted to say about this is that as well as as well as holding back from spending money on things that you might not be sure if you want to pursue yet or whatever, it's also important just to recognize, are you being pulled along by the special interests and focus areas of other witches, you know, or what might be kind of popular in the discourse right now. And I think this is probably more relevant than ever to mention because of this sort of renaissance that witchcraft is having right now, this uh, this sort of wave of interest that's been happening over the last, I don't know how many years. <laughs> I wish I could keep my finger on the cultural pulse to the extent where I actually know how many years it's been. But let's put it this way, there's a whole new crop of witchcraft books coming out. Mine is among them. It's called Rebel Witch, okay? You can buy it at all reputable bookstores. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's a big crop of, of new books coming out, massive wave of new influences coming out. Witchcraft is is really in the in the discourse again when it comes to spirituality and wellness and all that stuff. So I think this point uh, could stand to be laboured a little bit more than I probably would have mentioned it before. Because there's just so much amazing stuff happening, one self-loving thing to do for yourself as a practitioner is just make sure that you're interested in what you're doing. Make sure you're not pressuring yourself to be interested in something just because lots of witches are, just because it's the thing right now, just because a witchy influencer that you're interested in is interested in it. If you're not interested in it, if it's not flicking your switch, if you don't think it's necessarily going to vibe with whatever else is going on in your practice, put it down, you know, maybe come back to it at another time, think about whether or not you are feeling it and vibing with it more in the future. But if you're not right now, there is so much else that can pique your interest and you can commit to and be and, and be sort of, you know, um, devoted to and really deeply interested in. So it's really self-loving, I think, for us as witches to think to ourselves, is this really flicking my fucking switch all the way on? And if not, why am I forcing myself to focus on it so much? Why am I trying to fit it into my path where it doesn't quite fit, you know? I've definitely done that in the past. I've definitely felt like I should be practicing in a certain way or knowing a certain divination method or having books on a certain thing or having a certain witch's books. <laughs> And I've really sort of worked so much to unhinge myself from all that, darlings. I do what I want to do. I take an interest in the things that are really calling to me from the heart. And if they're not, that's okay. Sometimes I might think to myself, why is this not calling to me? I feel like I should be interested in this, or I really wish that I was, but I'm not interested in just squeezing something into my practice because of that pressure. That is not a self-loving way to witch. This actually leads me somewhat smoothly onto my next point, darlings, which is avoid social media that is connected to witchhood that does not make you feel positive. You know, maybe you've got some stuff on your feeds that you feel neutral about, or maybe you like some of the content produced by that creator or, you know, shown by that company, but not other stuff. That's fine. But if you're following accounts that are making you feel like you should be doing something or you absolutely cannot do something or you're not, you know, worthy of something or if it's just highly, highly aesthetic and polished and it's making you feel like your craft is not good enough. It doesn't matter what the intentions of that social media person is, that creator, that person that's making the post, their intentions might be all good. And they might just be really having a very beautiful time posting what they're posting and having no idea that it's having a negative effect on you. So it's not about them. It's about bringing it back to self and saying, hmm, you know what? This kind of content makes me feel like I don't want to go towards my craft and I don't want to do things or try things. It makes me feel afraid. It makes me feel unworthy. It makes me feel some kind of negative thing that actually isn't conducive to having a healthy happening witchhood. So let me unfollow, let me unsubscribe, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing personal about that, there's nothing inherently cruel or negative about that, you've got to curate your feeds, you know, and this is another thing that I think is just self-loving in wider life, 
but then I also bring it into my witchhood. I follow a lot of witches on the fucking internet, okay? I've been I've been really immersed in the witchcraft world for a very long time. I also love seeing what is new and who is new and what people are talking about that I might not have been aware of or I might not have seen. Um, and so for me, I definitely follow lots of different people, whether they've got one post or a thousand posts, you know, it doesn't matter how many subs they've got. If they look interesting to me, if I'm vibe with what they're saying or I'm interested in what they are going to go on to say, I will follow them. But I also give myself this really important permission to curate my feeds, you know. So if I just feel like there is something about a specific kind of content that is not vibing with me right now, or it, it just kind of made me feel something a little bit uh, about my own practice, it doesn't happen that often. But when it does, I just give myself permission to um, not look at that kind of content or not look at that particular creator's work, you know, and that's fine. You know, I give myself permission to make sure that I'm interacting with discourse in in witchhood, especially online, because I don't really hang out with witches um, offline, although I have a few friends who are witches or witchcraft adjacent, and that's lovely. But I don't go to like moots, I'm not in a coven, I don't do public ritual, I don't like any of that stuff. Um, it's not for me personally. So in the online realm, um, I just make sure that I'm having a good time and that I'm inspired and that I feel excited. If I'm starting to feel things that are kind of negative, like I'm coming across major gatekeeper energy or I'm just coming across energy that's making me just feel put off or, um, you know, I'm coming across material that's making me just feel something that is not that helpful, I will disengage from it. For me, there is a difference between witchcraft content that makes me think that challenges what I had previously believed and takes me down an interesting rabbit hole and then content that is just making me feel just yuck or bad or just like put off, you know? I do try to differentiate the difference between the two because I do want to be challenged and I definitely think that there is a political aspect of witchcraft that is very interesting for me. Um, I, I believe that I take my biases into witchcraft with me. I believe I take my laziness into witchcraft with me. I believe I take my, my sort of like mental blind spots into witchcraft with me and I would like to have that stuff challenged I would like to think about that stuff I would like to sort of think about where I sit with certain things and I like to be involved in certain dialogues or reading in certain dialogues that are heated you know so it's not just about okay I've just got my blinkers on and everything that I look at to do with witchcraft on the internet has got to make me feel like I've just popped some champagne otherwise I'm not interested Obviously, I want to get involved in dialogue and I, I am interested in debate and whatnot. So I try to differentiate. I'm like, hmm, okay, is this challenging me? Is it interesting? Is it making me think differently? Maybe that might make me feel a certain level of discomfort just on the basis that it's uprooting certain beliefs that have been foundational for me for a while. But that's a positive thing versus me feeling like I'm being just like full on attacked or my way of working in witchcraft is just being completely denigrated and demeaned here. And you know what? That's fine if that person has that opinion, but I don't need to be following along and seeing that crap on my feed, you know? So I think there's a difference between the two. I want to be challenged, yes, but I don't want to be insulted, darling. You know, who does? Who does? Who enjoys that? If you enjoy being insulted as part of a kink, it doesn't count, all right? We do not do kink shaming here on Planet Maddox, all right? That's that's not what's happening here. Honey Bunnies, it's time for me to have my sponsor intermission now. I want to talk to you a little bit about Skillshare. It's an amazing online learning platform and it's particularly well suited to creatives. And I would say also to people who are interested in self-development and you know personal growth and picking up tools and strategies to just improve your time management, the way that you approach creative creative projects and the way that you love and care for yourself. And I want to talk to you particularly about a course that has gripped me this month. Eugenia Washington has done a course on Skillshare called Confidence for Creatives, Five Exercises to Grow Confidence and Self-Care. I checked it out the other night and I love it. There are lots of innovative ideas in this course. One of the things I like most about it is that she encourages you to take a photo of yourself that you will use as your self-care talisman because it's a representation of your best self and the qualities and characteristics that are the most meaningful to you in your own nature that you want to celebrate more and connect with more. She also explains to you how to make a map of miracles, which is really awesome. She helps you to write a letting go letter. So there's lots of actual 
actual tools, there's actionables in this course, which I really appreciate about it. If you want to check out this course and so many others, you can click the link in the description down below to get a free trial of Skillshare. It's an affordable platform as it is, but getting the free trial gives you a chance to test drive this amazing platform before you decide whether you want to go ahead. And I really enjoy having premium Skillshare. I love that I can go back through the classes that I've watched, looking at my account page and just seeing how many classes I've watched, how many things I've brushed up on or learned more about. That is really satisfying for me. Um, and so, yeah, I'm sure it will be satisfying for you also. You do have to be one of the first 1,000 people to click the link underneath the video, darlings. So if you know that this is for you, you want to try out the trial, you're looking for something like this, go ahead and click down below and come and join me over on Skillshare. The next thing I want to touch on is not really so much to do with me because I think it's quite obvious that I am well and truly out of the broom closet, okay? <laughs> I left the broom closet long, long behind me, okay? <laughs> that wardrobe is somewhere a long way away and I am now the queen of Care Paravel. <laughs> so, you know, for me, I just feel like that moment where I sort of like walked through it and met Mr. Tumnus is just, you know, it's, it's so long away now. However, I do work with a lot of people and interact with a lot of people online for whom the question of whether or not you come out of the broom closet is still a very, you know, very significant, very relevant question. And for people in that situation, I would say, don't come out of the broom closet in situations where it's going to be a lot more trouble than it's worth. You know, I think people do put a tremendous amount of pressure on themselves uh, to come out of the broom closet. And I think it is because they feel that it will legitimize them as witches. So if there's a situation where someone's pressuring themselves to come out to friends or family members or maybe even in their professional life or online, whatever it might be, but they know that they're going to catch a lot of heat. They're not really sure how they will feel about certain people knowing. They don't know really whether or not they want to come out of the broom closet. It might create a lot of complications, etc. I think the pressure that people like that are putting on themselves is to do with legitimacy a lot of the time. It's like, yeah, but if I don't come out, if I don't say it, then can I really be it? Am I really it? And I'm here to tell you in no uncertain terms that yes, you are really it. And it's totally acceptable not to come out of the broom closet if you do not think it's going to be the self-loving decision for you to make. And that's got to come down to where you are in your practice, in your life, in your relationships. Um, and if you want to come out to certain people, but maybe not to other people, it's about trust. It's about risk assessment. It's about all of that stuff. No one gets to tell you, no one gets to tell you that because you are not out and proud and posting about it online or whatever, or, you know, because you want to put your witchcraft books in a separate part of the house so your parents don't see that you are not a witch, you know. Actually, you might just be doing something very self-loving uh, in your witchhood by taking heat off of yourself, taking pressure off of yourself, and choosing not to have conversations that actually wouldn't be interesting for you or fun for you or nourishing for you in the least little bit. And you're allowed to make those decisions. I think those decisions are very self-loving. Also, another thing I want to mention, actually, sort of adjacent to this is um, sometimes underneath my videos, I get comments from people who say, I'm not a witch, but I'm witchy. I don't claim the word witch, but I do certain things that fall under the witchcraft umbrella. And that's why I watch your videos, Kellyanne. And that's why I'm involved in these dialogues. But I'm not actually a witch myself. I think that's a very self-loving thing. The question of whether or not one owns the word witch is a very, very deep and vast question. Actually, it can get a little bit abyssal. I have definitely gone through massive dialogues with clients of mine, um, sometimes in, in rather a shadow working context, actually, about whether or not they can own the word witch, what it really means to them, why they have such a fractious relationship. Why is the relationship with the word witch so turbulent for them? Um, and, and there can be layers to that question. It's like an onion. OK, um, but one thing that I think is really deeply self-loving is to decide, OK, you know what? My journey with with the word witch might be lifelong, but I'm not going to stop myself from doing witchy shit. I'm going to let myself get on that gravy train. I want to enjoy that feeling of doing those things. And yes, I'm over here having this kind of dialogue with myself about what it means to be a witch or what it means to claim that and whether or not I want to claim that. But why should that mean I have to sit on the subs bench for my whole life and not do these things that I think would be really in enriching or interesting? So that's another thing I think is very self-loving. If you um, are watching this right now and you're like, I don't really know if I'm a witch or not. I really am not sure. I have gone back and forth with this. I've done the dance with it. 
um, you can continue to do that sweet fandango and still, you know, get get witchy. You know, you can do that sweet fandango and still dance the witchy tango. Stop it, Kellyanne. Stop it. Stop trying to come up with catchphrases. It's, no. Mm. Okay, so next thing I really want to put across. This is actually big. But I didn't realise for a long time how big it is because it takes for me to talk with people over and over again, like different people with different paths and different situations happening in witchhood. Sometimes it takes me to speak to quite a few people before I'm like, oh my God, this is legitimately an issue for people. This is something that might need to be addressed. This is something that I see come up over and over again. And that helps me better serve my community. Um, it helps me better serve my witchcraft clients who are want to talk to me about these things, right? One thing I've realised is bigger than I thought is that a lot of witches just don't feel like they can do magic for themselves. A lot of witches are very focused on doing healing for others, magic for others, focusing on protection for the family or focusing on protection for the community, sending really beautiful thoughts and intentions or magical power to friends or whatever um, for their challenges and what they're going through. Um, they bring their relationship to the altar. They bring their motherhood to the altar, whatever it might be. But they actually don't feel that comfortable just doing some full on fucking magic for what they want, actually connecting with their heart's desire. Um, and putting something into play for themselves, prayer for themselves, ritual for themselves, magic for their really juicy, exciting desires, you know, the things they want, mood boards, vision boards for their stuff. Maybe this doesn't include you as you're listening. You might be thinking, well, of course I use magic for myself. That's, I mean, witchcraft is a tool to enhance life. What am I doing if I'm not using it to enhance my life? But there are lots of witches, some of whom know it and some of whom aren't aware of it until we get talking around it, who actually just feel bad using magic for themselves. It is deeply self-loving in your witchhood for you to do magic and ritual for yourself. Um, it is potent and it also has this beautiful ripple effect in the world around you, in your relationships, in your professional life, in your parenthood or whatever. Because when you do magic to enhance your life, to protect yourself, to get your, you know, to take care of your business and get your shit on lock, as it were, that has this beautiful ripple effect outwards towards the people that you love. You know, they get to experience you as this um, really sort of clear and strong um, version of yourself. And so you are doing it for others. You're doing it for yourself, but you're doing it for others. You know, it can be both. If it's been a while since you did a ritual or a spell for yourself, since you focused on your healing, since you focused on your career goals or your financial goals, you know, your creative goals, please do it. Please, please do it. What is witchhood if it is not to at least partly enhance your own life, nourish and nurture yourself, inspire the fuck out of yourself, you know? Um, and I think if there are witches that are, you know, really just focusing all of their spiritual attention on others, it could now be just such a potent time for you to bring it back to yourself, especially in September. If you're somebody who likes to focus on self-love during the month of September, as I do, make sure your witchcraft is working for you, not just those around you. I personally very much love to have witchy check-ins, darlings. I think that's a very self-loving thing to do in witchhood is to sit down and have your review of what is happening with your practice. I know that a lot of people do a weekly review or a monthly review or kind of like a mid-year review that involves every single aspect of their life, you know, so what is going on like socially, sexually, creatively, spiritually, financially, domestically, and all of those things. Um, and I think that you can put your witchcraft into that review. But it's also helpful, I think, sometimes um, to just sit and think, how are things going for me spirituality wise? And just have that as, a, as a, a focused exploration, you know, get very clear about that as an important part of your life and think to yourself, is there anything that used to really fill up my cup that doesn't so much anymore? Is my attention being called somewhere different? And maybe I've been putting off really recognizing that and thinking about it, but now is the time to get clear and write down some intentions, you know? And also just think about what is not working, what feels good and what feels not so great, you know? What feels like it could be better 
and just try to write some stuff down around that um i know you know i myself like a lot of witches i do have a book of mirrors which is like a spiritual journal so whereas the book of shadows is usually something a bit more official with your sort of official bits and pieces in it um and maybe your spell workings and results and stuff like that your book of mirrors is going to be more like Dear diary, blah, 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 you know, like just writing about anything that's frustrating you, anything weird that happened, anything great that happened, anything you're looking forward to, just all kinds of stuff. But it's focused on witchcraft specifically. I love having a book of mirrors. And I think a lot of my reviews about my witchhood are, um, you know, really meted out in my book of mirrors where I just sit there and I think, what do I want as a witch? What is going right for me? What is the frustration? Where am I concerned? You know, and I just feel into it. I might not even know really that much what I'm going to write until I'm writing it. And then it just becomes this really useful tool for checking in regularly and thinking, what do I want to change? What do I want to do more of this week? What is exciting for me in witchhood? That is a really lovely thing to do for yourself. Very self-loving. Darlings, as many of you will know, I wrote an entire book on witching your own way. So I'm not going to labour this next point too much because I laboured it in 70,000 words in a book called Rebel Witch, which you can purchase and read. So I'm not going to labour it too massively because it's a massive, massive message for me and a huge passion of mine. But what I will say is take all advice as merely a smorgasbord of suggestions, okay? Do not let anyone take up space in your brain convincing you that in order to be a proper witch, in order to be a powerful witch, in order to be a legitimate witch, you've got to do it this way. It's got to be done this way. If it doesn't vibe with you, it doesn't vibe with you. If you don't feel like it's helping you connect to your witchy power, then it's not helping you connect to your witchy power. You sign off on what empowers you as a witch, what feels legitimate to you as a witch, and what you feel like you're going to go ahead and do. You know, you've got to really sit with your heart in witchhood and your heart is not the same as another witch's you know so um you know really just do the self-loving thing for yourself by recognizing that I feel like I really have given myself something so beautiful in my practice by just saying you know what um I'm gonna take I'm gonna take these different things I'm gonna process them I'm gonna put them through the lens of my consciousness and my particular needs in witchcraft and if something's not vibing it's not vibing and that's okay it's not a judgment of the other witch's path, but it is certainly not going to be a situation where I convince myself that because this other witch is more experienced or because they have more followers or because they have got books out or because they're part of a certain tradition or because they're hereditary, they know and I don't know. You know, I can totally appreciate that they might have knowledge I don't have. And I've come to that knowledge to gather something from their wisdom I want to receive their wisdom that's a beautiful thing but if I've just come if I just come to uh to everything in witchhood with the mindset of like I don't know and I guess I you know why would I know and somebody else needs to tell me and what works for somebody else will work for me as well I've gone wrong and that is unself-loving I don't want to do that in my witchcraft practice and, and I, I really don't want you to do that either it's just not it's just not fun and that makes me think about my final point that I want to definitely make before I wrap this up. Have fun. Have fun in your witchcraft. I knew long ago, quite a few years ago now, that one thing that had really shaped my perspective on witchcraft and what it could be for me um, were the early witchcraft resources that I, I explored, um, namely some websites and some books. Um, and a lot of the books were Wicca centric. The first resources I read were very, very Wicca centric. Nothing wrong with that at all. I'm just saying it how it is, right? That's what I had access to at the time. And the forums that I was on were like essentially message boards, you know, we're going, we're going way back here. And the, the articles that I would read and stuff, uh, I just got a flashback of like reading Witch Fox when I was was I 14? I can't remember. Anyway, <laughs> a little internet witchling baby. So um, yeah, one, sorry, I've got off, off track. Let me focus. So one of the things I realised shaped my perspective on what witchhood could be was the solemnity and seriousness of the resources that I first picked up. Everything just felt very fucking serious. Everything just felt, you know, very uh, dignified and solemn and like I don't know just serious um and you know what witchcraft is serious and the feeling I have around it a lot of the feeling I have around it is so 
it is a big deal to me. It is a big part of my life. And I do take it seriously. And it is serious to me. But I remember when I first cracked open Condensed Chaos by Phil Hine and I was reading about how to make a servitor and he was talking about, you know, the cat on the skateboard and stuff. I realised that that was the very first time for me that I'd ever cracked a book where witchcraft was described as, um, you know, something that was to do with having a lot of fun, having a fucking laugh, like playing, dressing up, pretending, seeing what happens if you just do this and do that and like... If you dress up and go, if like, see, go to a party dressed as like um, a corporate biz whiz or, um, you know, like a football hooligan, just somebody that you're not, you know, go to a party dressed up like that and see what happens. Uh, that's something that he writes about in Condensed Chaos. Um, and yeah, just like, there's just so much fun in Condensed Chaos and Prime Chaos where he talks about, you know, wearing a funny, weird hat and just walking down the street and just seeing what that does for you. He's writing about enclosed cognition. He's writing about ego deconstruction and how, fu like, ego deconstruction sounds so serious, doesn't it? It sounds really big and like, oh my God, overwhelming and very, you know, super serial. But actually, a lot of the ways in which it's described in, in Condensed Chaos and Prime Chaos, sorry, I can't remember which bits are in which books, but those two books, a lot of the ways in which he describes things like exercises for ego deconstruction are fun, like fun and funny. Um, and I remember reading those books and it was so revelatory to me. I was like, oh my goddess, that's what's been missing because I wasn't really given that direction early. Like, yeah, sure, I would read some books early, very early in my witchcraft journey that had one or two jokes in them. Um, you know, but like, it wasn't, it wasn't like this overwhelming idea that was being given to me that this is going to be fucking fun. You know, you're going to really enjoy yourself. This is, this is going to be joyful. You can belly laugh in sacred space. You can really play. You can be playful. You can be childlike. You can fulfill all of that part of your character in witchcraft. So, um, yeah, have fun and, and definitely bring your favourite witchy books and witchy movies and series and stuff into it and definitely play with pop culture witchcraft, you know, like, you know, bring your cartoon characters into it and all that jazz, your favourite fictional characters. I think that for me, there's got to be that focus on on belly laughing, having a good time, experimenting in a way that is joyful and irreverent, you know, and I think there's quite a bit of that energy in my book Rebel Witch as well, at least I hope there is. Okay, so these have been some thoughts from my own journey uh, about how to be a self-loving witch. I hope that these um, ideas have served you. Please let me know in the comments down below what is something that you do to be a more self-loving practitioner of the craft? Uh, what is something that you feel um, enables you to, to come at it from a self-loving perspective and make sure that you're on your own team? You are in your own coven. Okay. Much love and self-love, darlings. Blessed be. Mwah.